Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience in holding. We now have your presenters in conference. Please be aware each of your lines is in a listen-only mode. You may submit your questions electronically anytime using the chat pod located to the right of your webinar platform. You may also download a copy of today's presentation using the files pod located directly below the presentation. It is now my pleasure to turn the conference over to today's first presenter, Chris Hunt. Please go ahead. Thank you, Stephanie. Hi, everybody. Happy New Year. Uh, 13 days into it, and welcome to the January 2021 AHA Team Training Monthly Webinar. This month's title is A Path Forward, Lessons from the Field and Well-Being. Uh, Stephanie said, this is Chris Hunt, Senior Director with the American Hospital Association Center for Health Innovation, and I'm really happy to have you all with us here today. Thanks for joining. Some rules of engagement to quickly go over here. You can listen to the audio for this webinar in two different ways. You can listen to it through the phone. And if you do that, you'll want to mute your computer speakers so you don't get weird feedback. Or do it through your computer. Uh, I only warn that doing it through your computer, if you have a less than optimal internet connection, might lead to some delays in the audio. So we always tell people to check out the phone if the internet's not working well for you. All hyperlinks on the screen are active. If you click on them, uh, they'll just open another window. So you could have other windows open and keep listening to the webinar so you don't miss anything. And we'll do a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. The way that we do this is as we go, we'd love for you to chat in your questions in the chat pod that you're all using right now. I'll collect those questions and put together a Q&A session for the speaker. Uh, or we'll answer some of them as we go if those questions are more of the logistical type or you have a question that, that we can quickly answer. So please use the chat pod liberally as that's how we do Q&A. There's continu continuing education credit available for this webinar. You get an hour of CE credit, and that counts for CME, uh, uh, nursing, pharmacy, allied health, everybody. Uh, to do that, you need to create a Duke OneLink account. You only need to do this once. So if you are frequent flyers with us, you don't need to create that account again. And you could continue to use it for all future webinars. Instructions are found in the files pod that you see on your screen. It says instructions for webinar CE credit. Uh, it's also in your confirmation email. So you're going to want to text the code on your screen to the number you see on your screen uh, within 24 hours of this webinar. Uh, we'll put this code up on the screen again at the end of the presentation. Some upcoming team training events. So AHA team training is running virtual courses and workshops. Right now, our winter courses are all but sold out. They are, they are entirely filled. So if you're interested in taking a course with us, please jump on the wait list. We'll have more courses in the early spring. And when we do that, when registration opens, we will be the people who get the first bite at the apple. So that is uh, news there. Uh, webinars. So we have our normal monthly webinar February 10th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. And that's building strength in teams using team steps. So feel free to go and register for that. We also have an exciting announcement today. Uh, and so you'll see here the webinar for the overview on the new AHRQ Team Steps course for improving diagnosis. So uh, ARC and their contractor, MedStar Health Institute for Quality and Safety, are looking for practices to field test a new Team Steps course that's focused on strategies for improving diagnosis in outpatient clinic and hospital units. So this is a, a, a team steps for improving diagnosis. Uh, it's seven module train the trainer format. That's very similar to team steps for office based care. What uh, MedStar and ARC are looking for are 20 field test sites. They're looking for a mix of outpatient clinics, and hospital units. They're looking for organizations that have great experience with team steps, and also organizations that really don't have much team steps at all. So the first cohort starts in February of 2021, and they do monthly learning sessions to support the implementation, and they offer uh, continuing education credit for that. 
They also offer a small stipend to organizations to support the evaluation efforts. So if you are interested in this opportunity to be one of 20 field test sites for this new Team Steps product, register for the informational webinar with MedStar that you see the link on your screen for right now. Uh, and Jen is also dropping in the chat. Uh, or shoot MedStar a message. You can see the email address that's there on screen right now. So just wanted to pass along that pretty cool information. All right, today's presenter is Elisa Arspakachaga, who is the Vice President uh, with the American Hospital Association Physician Alliance. Elisa wears a variety of hats at the AHA, and she's a great presenter. Uh, we're very fortunate to have her with us here today. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn things over to Elisa and look forward to having a conversation with her at the end of the presentation. Elisa? Thanks, Chris, um, and thank you for inviting me back to join the team training group. I really enjoyed uh, presenting to this group and working with this group. Um, so I am going to take you through a couple of things, um, some objectives for us today. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the underlying and underpinnings of work-life balance and the role of leadership in addressing burnout and well-being. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the work that AHA has put out and has coming out around how organizations can start to address well-being for their teams. And then uh, I'm going to share a bunch of examples of how different organizations are doing this work. Before I get to some of this, I'm also going to talk a little bit about the current environment, which is obviously impacting a lot of people's well-being. So um, I thought this was an appropriate way to start uh, today's conversation. We all know the you know, metaphor of burning the candle at both ends. Um, I think we all know about where that leads. I feel like we may have actually you know, turned a flamethrower on said candle um, in 2020, and 2021 is proving no difference so far. So what are we to do about it? Um, I always start with this particular article um, in part be for, for two reasons. One, the date. It's from August of 2012. So this is not new. This is not something that, you know, we can thank 2020 for. Um, it's been a problem. It's not just doctors, although this headline highlights doctors. Um, but there are two. The other important part of this, this article and this why I keep mentioning it is the one in two U.S. physicians. This is obviously not a personal issue. This is a system issue. But how we're going to fix it is together. We can't fix it waiting for the system to change. There are things that we must do at the individual level to support that change. Um, because, you know, if we're waiting for the system to change, we have people who are burned out right now that we have to help. But let's understand a little bit about the water we're swimming in right now. This has always been one of my favorite cartoons. Um, understanding what, in fact, is impacting us. So before COVID, approximately one-third of hospitals across the country operated with a negative margin. So they operated in the red. Um, based on the study that AHA did, and this is on the AHA website, and we can put it in the chat. I forgot to put it on the slide. I apologize. Um, an AHA study done in... Um, I think this one was from July of this year, expected, and I would not be surprised if we see up to 50% negative margins um, across the field. So hospitals are doing much, much more with much, much less. Um, part of that is driven by the fact that Medicare and Medicaid historically have paid less than the cost of providing care. We've shuttered a large number of the outpatient um, clinics, things are opening up, they're closing back, they're opening up, and COVID really has been a huge financial threat. And thank you, Jen, for knowing which report I meant and putting it in the chat. Um, and it's really been sort of this triple whammy um, impact. Uh, you've had both the, you've had first the surge preparedness, the how do we get ready for surge. We've had people paying, you know, astronomical prices for PPE challenges with getting enough staff, whether, you know, your staff were out sick or quarantining, 
making sure we had the right number of people to be able to care for um, just unprecedented numbers of patients and the people with the right skills in the right places. How do we support the teams? We're now creating brand new teams and different ways of working. Everything as simple as, you know, the innovation of running really long IV tubing so that you can keep the pump outside the room so you don't have to use PPE to go check a pump in a COVID patient's room to how do we organize our own cell? How do we organize ourselves so that we can take the one or two experts we have in this specific area who can then manage a, te a broader team who can take care of all of these patients? Who are our experts in different places? How do we engage with our orthopedic team that probably has, especially if they're the spinal team, has a lot of experience in proning during surgery to help us with, you know, ICU patients who need to be prone because that's actually going to help them um, recover better. So really looking at very different ways of working and a lot of uh, teamwork on the fly and all of that takes time and it takes effort and it takes thinking and in many cases here takes extra co costs and resources. We obviously had, you know, infrastructure needs and upgrades everywhere from setting up tents in the parking lot to do COVID testing um, to understanding how do we make space for social distancing in our clinics. The shutdowns and slowdowns I mentioned and then the overall economic impact where you were seeing rising numbers of uninsured as folks lost jobs. So things were not getting better. And we've heard, um, this is a, from a study that uh, Shanafelt did earlier in the pandemic, I believe this is an April publication date, um, possibly May, but really he asked healthcare professionals what they needed during the pandemic which obviously ties to their well-being. And these, these were really the key ideas that came out of that paper. This idea of hear me, listen to me, listen to my expertise, let me help where I know how to help. Um, I don't think there's a healthcare professional who didn't run into this particular fire to be able to help people. Um, but, you know, are challenged when they don't feel like they're being heard or their expertise isn't being um, utilized to take the best care of patients. So how do we make sure that we are um, listening to those experts we have in our own buildings? The second, um, protect me, is really, um, I think this might have been more of a concern early on in the pandemic. We didn't know what we didn't know. Um, people were afraid to go home. People were afraid to, you know, expose their families, uh, understand, you know, whether they, you know, needed to take a shower at the hospital before they went home, change their clothes, how, how can they be in their job fully, but also protect their family? Understanding how we prepare and train everyone to do this vast myriad of jobs that, you know, got moved around a lot. Uh, the understanding how, and this is what I'm going to talk about a lot more, but how do we support those folks who, you know, are likely seeing more deaths in the hospital than they've ever seen. They're seeing patients suffer alone. They're being surrogate family members for their, their patients because, you know, we can't, we couldn't have more people in the hospital. We couldn't have that um, family member holding their hand. And so I know many of you were that, that family member. And so how do we really ensure that we're supporting people who are going through that trauma? And then that last one of caring for the whole individual, understanding you know, where it is people need childcare, where they need lunch, dinner, where they need those kinds of immediate supports, and then what are the longer term supports? I'm going to share just a couple of things. Um, I'm going to, with the giant caveat that these are things that individual organizations did, and many of you, I'm sure, did them as well. And some of them were really, really great. But as you'll hear me talk as I go through this, the most effective way to address burnout and improve well-being is to really look at what 
your own teams need. None of the things I'm going to say on this list are going to be things that, um, some of them are going to be things that touch your team, some of them aren't. And for each of you, a different thing is going to be the thing that, that gives you hope, that you know revitalizes you, puts a little bit more gas in your tank so that you can go back and, and continue to do your work. Um, so I would say, you know, there's no magic bullet to this. It's all, all of these could work or none of these or some of them. So I, but I do love some of the creativity um, and these come from a couple of different organizations. Um, but everything from putting a Peloton bike, which I would vote for for me personally, in the doctor's la in one of the lounges, it wasn't the doctor's lounges, um, to having um, on-demand counselors available uh, first via an app, and then you know you could set up a phone appointment um, to really just talk through what they were experiencing. I've heard a number of organizations looking at pairing. Um, clinicians in, who work in different areas and, in, in fact, um, several hospitals formed partnerships across cities to connect um, peers so that they could just talk with each other about what they were experiencing, cry together, talk about, you know, what they were seeing in their day, how they were coping, and what they were doing. Um, creating spaces for decompressing whether it's you know a relaxation room or a space where you could just take a breath. I know um, many of you, I'm sure, had um, food available. Many of the organizations in our own communities did a lot to support um, providing food and uh, all sorts of different uh, you know resources to our staff. Um, one organization had a um, live virtual prayer session every day um, that people could join into. And if that was helpful to you, that was a resource. Debrief sessions along the lines of the Schwartz rounds of giving people space to talk about what they've um, felt. Then other more practical, if you will, um, less about supporting, patient, uh, supporting caregivers, but things like making sure their communications were incredibly clear and incredibly detailed and really providing as much information as possible. Um, leaders walking the floor, talking about what they're doing, uh, making sure everyone is aware of where the organization is, where supplies are, how they're supporting um, their caregivers doing work to train around telehealth visits and how to do that work, creating a very clear uh, frequently asked questions on their website. Again, demystifying some of the work that's being done and creating space. Um, one organization actually as sort of an immediate response created this, this rapid response process where um, they took their standard huddle process and escalated it all the way up to the CEO. And they realized a few months into the pandemic that this was actually a really great way to get things done. And so they've kept it, even though their surge has, has quieted down, they've kept using that um, process of escalating um, issues through, through their huddle process till it got to senior management and they were able to be much more efficient. So we've learned some stuff that we can take forward. So. With that, um, those are some immediate pandemic um, response activities. But let me dive back into some of the broader well-being, um, resilience, burnout work that still needs to be going on in the background and that many organizations used as the structure upon which they um, quickly pivoted to address some of these um, issues specific to the pandemic. So you all know this. Um, there are different influences on resilience and well-being from your own personal impact, how you react to the world around you, to the immediate day-to-day -day environment in which you're in, the health system in which you're in, to those broader regulatory and cultural factors, the regulations we must abide by from a Medicare and Medicaid perspective, and some of the, the culture of medicine and how we train and expect um, physicians and nurses and other clinicians to, re to react. Um, and what's happening, and we've seen it 
in many, many, many different ways is that we're creating this culture of reducing our ability to empathize. We're making care worse, if you will, in so many ways, because we're starting to see more and more studies that have connected the depersonalization element of burnout to worse patient outcomes. Um, and these are just two studies. There are many more out there that have looked at how patients actually take longer to recover, have worse satisfaction, even after controlling for severity for demographics, if their own physician is burned out. So it's not only that you're burned out, it's that you're actually providing worse care or worse, there are worse outcomes. Let's not say you're providing worse care. Um, at the same time, we have clinicians who are spending nearly six hours per day. This study really blew me away. Um, in the EHR, 25% of that time is inbox management. Now, looking at my own bit inbox, you would think that that's perfectly reasonable, even though I am not a physician. Um, it probably takes at least 25% of my day. But I'm, I'm not a doctor. I didn't, you know, I'm not treating patients and then having to go manage an inbox. Uh, and we all, I'm sure, saw the Annals of Internal Medicine report that last year indicated it could be costing the country as much as six billion, with a B, dollars a year in physician turnover. The numbers are no better for nurse turnover. The numbers are no better for almost any clinical position turnover. They are staggering. And part of it is that electronic record. Um, this is a study the AMA did. Um, it's actually the one I quoted on the previous page. Um, the link is on the previous page, but basically they looked at when people were in the EHR. So this black line is the um, during the week, and you see round about eight o'clock in the morning, steep increase in percent of you know EHR work time. Um, and it stays up here pretty solidly till about 6.30, 7 p.m., and then it starts to drop off. This other line, the dotted line, is on the weekend. And my favorite part of this graph is this. That is from 8 p.m. to about 11 p.m. on Saturday or Sunday night. So date night is now um, with the EHR, which isn't helping anybody. Um, so this is a problem. But we can't just say, okay, let's get rid of the EHR. Let's, you know, change the way we document. Some of those things we can say. Some of those things, even if we made them perfect, we probably still would have challenges. So we need to think a little more upstream. What is really driving all of this work? And I'm going to go through these a little quickly. I'm sure you've heard them in various settings. But um, this is from the seminal work on burnout, which was Christina Maslach's report in 1980. Um, and these were the six areas, domains of work life that she correlated to burnout. Now, um, just a couple of points um, here. The On workload, it's not about, well, among clinicians I've found, it's really not about the amount of workload, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's about having work that they find meaningful. Um, I think the two, if I had to pick two on here that are especially um, pain points now, the first is community. Um, we, are, we are social beings. The more that we can share with others and understand how others um, you know, can help us and we can help them, the better off we're gonna do. The other, I would say, is probably control. Um, and that's not control of the situation, that's control over what's needed to do my job. So if I feel I can do my job effectively and have control over the factors that are going to impact how I do my job, I'm usually pretty satisfied. But not having that control, feeling like I can't make things better for those that I'm caring for, that's, that's a really hard impact. So as I mentioned, um, the on the quality, the, and this is another study that really looked at, it wasn't the number of hours physicians worked in particular. 
It was about their perceived ability to manage their workload and manage those ancillary pieces that influenced how they were able to get their work done. To put it another way, um, this, was, this was a study that looked at how much support they felt their clinic provided to their patients. And for those clinics where they felt like patients' social needs were being asked and addressed, that they had those connections, they had those resources, and they were seeing their patients be treated as whole people and have the needs outside of the immediate physical needs being taken care of, were much more likely to have lower burnout and to actually be more satisfied with their work. So they had control over those areas around them and could make things better for their patients. I think this, is, um, this isn't just healthcare. I think this applies to everybody. This is one of my favorite articles, and um, Chris and Jen will both tell you I've sent it to just about everybody I know. It was in Harvard Business Review last year, two years ago now. Um, links at the bottom. And this really talked about how we have shifted as a culture, as a nation, and as a people to really think about and value busyness. I want you to think about to, you know, the three or four conversations you've had today with your colleagues, with friends. Did you actually manage to have one of those, you know, normal exchanges of good, how are you doing, where you didn't say, well, you know, real busy. We value busyness. We think it's important. A hundred years ago, um, People, you know, showed their wealth by talking about how they shared, how they spent their leisure time. And now we've sort of shifted to talk about being busy. Now, I don't know if inherently that's a bad thing, but what it has led us to is by wanting to be busy, not creating space for that important thinking time, for those conversations, for that um, connection and for that space to really, you know, do that important work. And sometimes when you get in that phase where you just have so many things flying at you and you're just doing the next thing that's in front of you and, and sort of picking off those low-hanging fruit tasks, you actually get dumber. You lose about 13 IQ points, according to this um, article, in that stage. And, and I know I've personally gotten there when I'm looking at my email and I go and click on all the calendar appointments and like clear those because I feel like I'm accomplishing something and I've at least cut down from, you know, 200 messages to 175 and, and that feels like a sense of accomplishment, which isn't really. But how do we think about that? Like if we aren't creating time to do the important work, to do the connection, to do the thinking, how are we actually feeding ourselves to be able to care for those around us? So that's a lot of talk about burnout and where it comes from and, you know, some of the things that you can do to address it. But I think there are some, certainly some very personal things we can all do. At the same time, I think there are some very systemic things that need to happen because we all know that culture eats strategy for lunch. We've all seen that and illustrated in various ways. But I would argue as a, a good child of the 70s who spent most of my childhood afraid to go in the ocean because of Jaws, um, that we really need the infrastructure to support people doing the right thing, taking the time that they need to be um, with their families, with their friends, doing the things that bring them joy and reconnect them to and, and recharge them. Um, we all need that space. And on some level, we need our systems to help us do that. That doesn't mean we have to wait for the system um, to be fixed because that's going to be a little while. But start to think about the ways that we can use the system we have and the system in which we work. And I'm using system in a more generic sense than a specific health system. But how do we use that to improve our space so that we can start to use those, those internal, those individual, excuse me, um, mechanisms that can help support us 
and start to move forward. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about the um, our first well-being playbook. Again, link on the screen, um, which is available on the AHA website. This came out uh, last year and sorry, a year and a half ago. Um, really walked through both case examples and resources on how organizations can think about building well-being programs that really address the needs in their organization. And when we get to the end, I'll tell you, give you a little uh, preview of the next version of this that will be coming out later this month. So what are those seven steps that we came up with? Now, this is based on research um, into the literature on burnout, looking at the resources that are available, and then uh, conversations across the country with hospitals and health systems that are doing this work. And on our website, we have a number of case examples from organizations. I'm going to go through a few for um, each of these steps. So starting with creating the infrastructure for well-being. As I said, if you don't have an infrastructure of some sort to make it easy to do the right thing, people are going to revert. And I don't think I need to tell a group of folks listening to a Team Steps webinar about the importance of having that structure and having those norms agreed to. Um, so the first example I'm going to tell you about is at the University of Rochester, which is actually more than a six hospital system now. I need to update that. Um, but they really um, looked at, and the, the work there is led by a psychiatrist who was very interested in the impact of burnout on the brain and on executive function and on the ability to really connect disparate um, activities when stressed. And what he realized through his work and his study and, and working with others is that you actually lose some of that ability. And he realized that what was happening was that, in fact, it was impacting patient safety and quality and patient experience to have burned out um, clinicians. And so he started looking at what are those human factors that are impacting how we deliver care that are related to burnout. And as he did that, what he was able to do was really connect well-being of the clinical staff to improved um, patient satisfaction, to improved quality, to work that was already being done without the within the organization. So he really made sure that this wasn't a new thing they were doing. They were just adding to what they had already been doing to improve quality. And I think that's one of the key um, lessons that I've seen across the country is that in those places where you can take advantage of an infrastructure that exists, you can help support this work. This, if you... Remember, nothing else of what I say over this hour, this is the most important slide. Ask the people doing the work. They know exactly, usually, where the problem is. Um, if you ask them, they will tell you. They probably have already, you know, fantasized or had thought about or discussed or talked about among themselves solutions. They understand where they might be. So really, this is another, um, it's, it's probably to me the most important part of this, is to really look for ways to engage the team in this work and understand how they can help. This is an example from Avera Health. It's 300 plus facilities, over 30 hospitals, and their CMO realized they have an employee assistance program and it wasn't really getting used, but he could see that his physicians um, in particular, many of them were burned out, and he saw they weren't using it. So he realized that, you know, if you build it, they're not necessarily going to come. So what he did was really create this roadshow and create some tangible pieces to it and say, and go around the country saying, this is important, and you need to understand that you need to do this. And I see a note from Chris. I will fix that. Thanks. Um, so don't click on the link to the uh, well-being playbook just yet. We have to change where it's located. Um, but we'll do that right after this. So, um, and 
the other piece about the Avira example that I think was really great was um, one of the most successful pieces that they talked about was they actually created a Facebook group for the spouses of their um, clinical teams who actually did more to support each other and further um, the work than they ever thought. Like he hadn't, as, when he started this work, hadn't thought about reaching out to spouses and other family members. But when you think about the impact, it makes sense. All right, um, measure. You've got to measure. You've got to know where you stand. And as you design interventions, you need to understand how those individual interventions are, are helping or not helping, and then have a baseline that you're monitoring. Now, one thing I'm gonna warn about here that um, the example from Minnesota that they also found is that many of the um, surveys and in the uh, playbook, there is a uh, link to the validated surveys that are out there. So you can choose um, what's most effective. They are lagging indicators. So things are going to take a while to show up. Um, so understand how you can do milestone measurement in, and really understand where the individual activities are. Across the state of Minnesota, they have done this, I think this is the fourth time they have done it now, um, have been measuring burnout across the state and helping to connect where interventions have happened with where that data has gone. So they've actually joined as an entire um, state to really track where their own burnout is happening. Now, as I said, when you design interventions, you have to ask people what they need. Um, this is Atlantic Medical Group in New Jersey, um, and what they realized was that they were having, as like I'm sure all of you can experience, they rolled out a new EHR and folks were um, just, you know, they everyone had their own challenge with it. And what they realized was that one class was not going to do it. One big like session for everybody was not going to solve the problem. So what they realized was they, they weren't going to fix anything with that. So they went after what they could fix, which was create this um, takeout menu of where are you having challenges? Check which things you need help on, and we will provide customized help. We will figure out how to support you where you need help and not teach you about some feature that you may not need. We might try to help you understand how you could use said feature to get to this thing, but really trying to fix the problem that needed fixing and not the one that didn't. And by doing so, they actually got much more engagement in their EHR and folks felt like they were empowered to, to use it as a tool. So they, they asked, what do you need? And folks told them. So the next um, three are going to sound remarkably like the end of a PDSA cycle, but this is what needs to happen. Um, as you design interventions, you need to implement, you need to evaluate the specific program impact, and then this probably, you know, the, among the more important ones, you need to create that culture. This can't be a top-down activity. It can't be a bottom-up activity. It's got to be both and. Um, you need, you are going to need some leadership support, and I think the good news is that there's a lot of interest in the field, a lot of understanding in the field about the importance of this. And while resources are tight, I think that's one of the things you're going to start to see more and more folks understand the importance of supporting our teams and looking at where can we make changes that are going to support our teams. But it also needs to be from the bottom up. We need to engage our teams and reach them where they are and understand what is it that we can do to support. Um, I can't say this strongly enough, leadership matters. It absolutely matters. Um, people will follow you for one of two reasons. They believe in you or they're afraid of you. And if they're afraid of you, they will stop following you the moment they can find someone else to follow. So understand 
what kind of impact you have as a leader of whoever you lead is um, is really important. So I, I love this image because, of course, if I, as I understand it, if you are in that space shuttle, you have no idea what's happening behind you because you're looking up. You're looking at where you're going. But think about as you enter a room today or enter a virtual room today, which is probably more likely, um, what kind of impact are you having and what kind of aftermath are you leaving behind yourself? Um, this is another resource I just want to mention that we will be hopefully doing more in 2021. Um, it's a three-day intensive program we do um, at the um, AHA's Physician Alliance in partnership with Navant Health and One Team. Um, and it's really an intense look at the, the cross-section of leadership and burnout. And um, we'll have more, there's more on our webpage, which is aha.org forward slash physicians if you have interest in this. We don't yet have 2021 dates because we don't know yet what 2021 will bring, um, but encourage folks if they're looking for something like that to um, just send me an email. I'll put my email up at the end of this. Then the last thing I wanted to touch on, and then I'll answer some of your questions, um, is uh, a little bit of a preview. Um, the MPAA did not, in fact, look at this, but I just thought this was cute, is the next version of the Wellbeing Playbook. Now, this hopefully will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. And um, really, this playbook looks at two areas. One is what are those leadership supports that are needed to grow the programs that I'm hoping many organizations created after we put out our first playbook? How do you take what you learned from those programs and grow and scale it? How do you do the next version? And then um, it includes a section on personal supports. How do we, while we are growing this leadership and growing this, these organizational level programs, how do we support the person? How do we ensure that we aren't burning out our teams, that we aren't um, damaging those who are in, in healthcare today. So with that, I'm just going to quickly summarize three sort of key points. One, all of this work is cultural. It's going to take time to really shift there are a lot of incremental things you can do along the way that can help give you hope and support. Um, but it will take time. And, and don't think you're finishing this by Q2 of 2021. It will, it will take some time, but you can get there. Um, second, having that strong in infrastructure will help support a strong culture. So places where they really have put this in place with that ability to make it easy to do the right thing have really been able to thrive. And when things get tough, that infrastructure sort of catches them and helps them keep doing that right thing. And then the last, which I said before, um, you need to address this from the top down, the bottom up, everyone. Everyone is, as we've seen from 2020, everyone can experience burnout. And everyone can be tried by their situation. And they have to look at how they react to the situation. And then we have to look at how our organization helps us, protects us from that situation and helps us mitigate that situation to be able to work together. So I am going to um, ask a question of you all. Um, some of you may know what this number is. Some of you may not. Um, I usually ask people to guess, but um, in the interest of time, I'm going to tell you it is how many hours you have coming to you in the next week. So um, in the next 168 hours, if I'm doing my math correctly, we will have inaugurated a new president. So that's something that's going to happen in the next 168 hours. In the la you know, last 168 hours, you have spent almost an hour with me hearing about burnout. My question to all of you is, 
what are you going to do in that next 168 hours before the inauguration? One thing, one hour to address either your own challenges or those of a member of your team. So, um, and I see someone has put a um, example in, I love examples, so if I don't, see, I will get the chat and I'll get your emails, but I am also going to put up my email address and my phone number. Um, I would love to hear about your programs and what you've done because it's one of the things that connects me to my purpose and brings me joy is to hear about the great programs that are out there and be able to share them with others. Um, so with that, I am going to turn it back to Chris and be happy to answer any questions. And uh, thank you. Elisa, thank you so much. That was really great. I really appreciate the presentation, and I think along with a lot of other people, we're excited to see the uh, 2.0 version of the handbook. So that's a nice teaser for later uh, later in the month. So that's great. Uh, I have a couple questions, and then I'm sure more will continue to roll in. Uh, early on, uh, when we were focusing a little bit more on COVID in this presentation, uh, someone asked a question that said, Many clinicians are dealing with death more, more often during this pandemic. Uh, the staff that has worked in units that have had many deaths due to long-term illness or sudden acute illness seem to be less prone to severe stress from this, but many others that are not used to it are experiencing this and having a difficult time. So do you have any suggestions or best practices that you've seen uh, at this individual's organization, they were trying to use peer support and 24-7 stress phone lines uh, with internal behavioral health support. But just anything else that you've heard or, or recommend? Absolutely. And I, we've certainly heard that. Um, I was speaking with one anesthesiologist who, who talked very poignantly about having intubated some, you know, 70 patients over the last few days. and having and the realization that struck him that at least 30 of those folks he was the last face they would ever see and i mean it's i'm not sure how you sit with that completely um but we i have heard of organizations using um their um, whether it's called their second victim or um, other peer support type activities um that they've deployed in times of um, medical errors, but some of that same resource of trauma support um, using those um, mechanisms. Um, and in fact, I have a colleague who's um, looking at studying how some of those mechanisms might help in, in this case. Um, but the use of Schwartz rounds is another um, space, but really creating space for, um, for folks to, to be able to talk about it um, either with peers or um, the other intervention I've seen is um, with outside, um, whether it's through an employee assistance program or something along those lines, but with an outside counselor. Um, or um, the last one I'll mention is actually um, an app, which is completely um, AI-based, so it's basically cognitive behavioral therapy, but completely based in AI that um, one organization was using to, to just help people verbalize their feelings and, and, well, I guess with their thumbs, talk about their feelings um, through this app. That's really interesting, uh, that, that use of technology. Mm -hmm. uh, that, I'd be curious to hear how that, how that comes about, how people are, are utilizing it. Um, could you perhaps, Spend a moment, if you can, going a little bit more into some of the wrinkles uh, or new suggestions, new things that are in the new playbook. We've had a couple people ask similar things. We have some fans out there of the playbook, I think. <laughs> well, great. I'm, I'm really excited to share it with folks. Um, so what we did with this one was really look at, um, start from the premise of, okay, so you've created this you know, 
well-being room on 6 West that has a comfy couch and people really enjoy it. Now, A, what did you learn from that? What is it that people value? How do you evaluate that so that you understand what it is that's making people appreciate that? And is it scalable? Is it movable? Is it translatable to a different area? And in some cases, the answer is going to be yes, exactly the way it was. In some cases, it's going to be, well, parts of it work, parts of it don't work. And understanding where those, um, sort of critically being able to look at what are the pieces that you can move. Um, so that's part of the work um, that's in this report. And we've connected to, again, a number of case examples um, and resources and articles that others have done. Um, what I was what I really hope this will provide is a shortcut to every organization doing the research themselves on how to do this. Um, my idea is that hopefully we can, you know, help people really think, hey, here's what we have. This is how we can evaluate it. This is how we can spread it. This is how we can get a handle on what resources we need versus what we have. Um, in terms of some of the more personal supports that are in um, this, it does connect to a lot of the examples I mentioned in terms of specific interventions that organizations are doing in times of COVID to support their teams. Um, so I gave you just a, a couple of ideas, um, but you know, a number of the activities across the country um, are, are highlighted throughout that. Thanks. That's, that's great. Um, there's just a question that came in from Beth that I think would be interesting to bring up right now. Um, if you, and obviously people can add in in the chat as well, uh, if anyone has heard about, uh, there's any resistance to anyone experiencing uh, using the employee assistance programs due to the fact that they are benefit connected into the employer? Yeah, and um, I know particularly physicians, um, there are a lot of concerns from physicians about how you can access these services. Um, we've certainly worked with the FSMB and others to look at um, some of the very stigmatizing questions that are on medical licensure, and it's not just medicine, but um, on licensure documents about um, mental health support and understanding that those questions just don't make sense. Um, and really, um, I have heard, especially among physicians, some resistance to using those programs, which is part of why the um, CMO at Avira, part of his message was, you know, I use this, making it okay for people to, to access that service or making them feel it's okay. So, I think, you know, there's certainly work to be done around being clear about where the separations do and don't exist with your EAP. Um, so that's one method to um, to help make some of those connections. I agree with some of the comments. They can be um, a little more cumbersome and hard to navigate. I'm seeing a lot. That is one of the places where I think I'm seeing more improve, rapid improvement from hospitals and health systems because they're realizing that some of the, what was the more traditional. Um, yeah. I think has you, changed. This, this next question I'm going to ask is something that I think anytime you're trying to make some sort of change in healthcare or other, people, you know, say that idea of, you know, the only solution that they want to offer is we need more staff, right? So in this situation, it's, you know, people are disengaged due to burnout. Yeah. And how do you even get them to start helping with finding solutions? And they're like, get more staff, right? And that's that. <laughs> that that's the true but useless information, right? Like, we all need more staff, but we can't do anything about it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, and I, I was just telling um, – the, the team just a little earlier, I was on a call, another session this morning, and um, got to be on a panel with Brian Sexton, who I just think the world 
talking about some of those micro um, interventions that, that he's so popularized and so studied to really have gas in the tank to think mm -hmm. broadly than we need more staff. Because I, I agree with you, that's, um, it's, it could be that, you know, given in the given situation, really that is the only solution. But so many times there are other solutions and giving people that space to to just recover enough to be able to even think beyond the next ten minutes, um, I think is one of the the interventions that can help get beyond that. Because yeah, I mean that's not going to be a reality in healthcare, especially when, which is why I started with the look at the, the hospital margins. I, I don't know anybody, administrator, clinician, who's in healthcare because they think it was an easy job or because they don't sure. want to kill people. Yeah. So we've got to work together. You know, some of those micro solutions kind of brings me back to a question earlier you know, about if there's any team step skills that might really help with burnout. And Jen posted a link to some of the uh, education we did around helping, uh, you know, team step skills helping in COVID specifically. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, any of that stuff that you think of that leads you to feel more mutually supported or yeah. to feel like you have a shared mental model from any of the different team step tools, that feeling of having a team I know shows up in work of people like Brian Sexton about that the feeling of having a conversation, having that one good conversation or having that one team mentality just helps people in small ways kind of you know incrementally uh, deal with their burnout. I, okay, I really love what Chad just said, the, the goal, go out and look. Uh, yeah, that's wonderful, and and I agree. I think that um, it's why I'm such a big fan of this group. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for you know that team approach. The more people feel like they are part of a team, they feel they are part of a connected, interconnected organization. That's going to drive well-being. Well-being is not one thing. Um, it's not going to be one thing. You check a box and now you're well. It's an ongoing yeah. activity. And so I think we need to look for all the supports we have that can help make it better. But with that, I will let you do your uh, final wrap up and thank you all. Um, really looking forward to digging through the chat and all the great examples. And again, please feel free to email me um, if there's anything you're looking for that you didn't get. Yes, for sure. Thank you so much, Elisa. That that was great. And I do think that there's going to be a lot of great side conversations happening with the amount of offerings that people have dropped in the chat. So that's really, really cool. And that's why I love this community. And I'm not just saying that because you guys are always amazing interacting with each other in, in the chat. So thank you all. Um, just those final reminders. Uh, we'll send you an evaluation shortly in your email. We'd love for you to comment back. We take a look at those all the time and, and use them to help make changes and to help kind of direct our, our way forward and our mission forward. Uh, to get that continuing education credit, it's really important uh, that uh, opening in the next two minutes uh, and then for 24 hours after that, you can text into that number that you see on your screen and drop in the code that you see on your screen. Uh, so other than that, we will be getting in touch with everybody uh, with the recording of this webinar as well as with uh, information about the uh, toolkit, the Wobby toolkit. And we look forward to hearing from you all in the future. And seeing you all next month in February. So thanks again to Elisa, and thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's presentation. You may now disconnect.